Good morning. My name is John Marshall. Uh, I am the director of the Otto J. Ruish Center for the Cure of GI Cancers. And on behalf of the Ruish Center, Georgetown University, MedStar Health, welcome. We all know, we are aware, that there is incredible progress being made in the world of cancer and cancer medicine. We are seeing improved outcomes. We are in seeing incredible new discoveries uh, in the world of cancer and cancer medicine but it is coming at an increasing cost. Um, we have a dramatic global imbalance. Only about one in seven people on our planet has access to cancer care today. And so cancer care has evolved to become somewhat of a luxury item, if you will. And so part of our challenge too, not only on a local level and in a nation where we have so many resources, is how do we extend those resources to those around us? We have the beginnings of a discussion around value. What is the value of what we're doing? Who should be paying? And what is a patient's responsibility for their own health care? Are we a collective, a nation where we're all going to chip in and take care of each other? Or are we a world uh, where we're individually responsible uh, for our health care and therefore uh, uh, perform in an individual way and responsible in an individual way? And we'll talk about this and, and other issues going forward. But I wanted to open our morning um, with uh, not only my boss, but just a brilliant uh, speaker uh, on the world of uh, cancer and cancer medicine uh, today and the progress we are making, the, but the, some of the barriers that are out there going forward. And I thought he would be a great person to come and kick off our morning with an overview for us all. And that's Dr. Lou Wiener. And Lou is coming up. Uh, Lou is an incredibly talented man, not only a uh, wonderful physician, um, uh, who maintains a practice to this day, but is also our director of our cancer center, uh, plays several leading roles within the NIH and other uh, panels around the country and around the world, uh, and has become uh, really my Obi-Wan, if you will, on, on the world of, of cancer and cancer medicine. And so he's here today uh, to share his thoughts and to open our meeting. Dr. Lewis Wiener. Thank you, John, or should I call you Luke or uh, <laughs> Darth or whatever? whatever. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a, real, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, John really kicked it off beautifully by talking about the sort of peculiar state we find ourselves in now with these extraordinary opportunities caused by advances in research, yet at the same time, inequities in how these advances are being translated in, into the larger population, the cost of this care, and really how we're going to be able to move forward. And I'm going to start off by asking an audience participation question. And nobody who is an oncologist is permitted to answer this question. But uh, I'm going to ask, so how many P Americans are going to get cancer this year? Does anybody answer it? Give me a guess. How many? 50,000 is one guess. Any other guesses? How many people will get cancer? Pardon? Five million. Five million. Okay, so we've got a high of five million and a low of 50,000. The real answer is 1.6 million people who are Americans will, will, will be diagnosed with cancer this year. How many Americans will die of cancer this year? 400,000, that's an, uh, an interesting uh, estimate. So you're suggesting that more than two out of three people who are diagnosed with cancer will be cured. It's sort of, I'm just wondering because the 50 plate virtually increased. No, it does not. Okay, then I go back. <laughs> okay, other, other estimates? Okay, who said that? You win. <laughs> it's about 600,000. About 588,000, 600,000 Americans will die of cancer. So now let's take a, let's t think about that. That's about two out of three Americans who are diagnosed with cancer will be cured. One out of three will die. In 1971, when the National Cancer Act was established, there were about one million cases of cancer, which is about the same age uh, population adjusted incidence because of the increase in our population. And the death rate was roughly 50%. So in a span of 40 years, which is you know, within the lifespan of most of the people in this room, we have gone from taking a killer disease that killed you know, six, uh, you know, half of its victims to now a killer disease that kills only about a third of its victims. That's remarkable progress. That means that roughly 
250,000 people are probably alive and being cured of their cancers today who were not cured, would not have been cured had there not been the advances of the last 40 years. And that's pretty fantastic. That's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is that 588,000 people are going to die of cancer, and we still have a lot of work to do. So you've heard so much about, you know, so how did that happen? So it happened through a lot of things. And some of it had to do with just us developing healthier behaviors. We smoke fewer cigarettes. Uh, we are watching our weight a little bit better. Some of us, some of us not. Um, and uh, we have taken steps to have better early diagnosis through uh, increased penetration of mammography, uh, colonoscopy, uh, things of that nature. But a lot of it's also been better therapies, more effective therapies, particularly the use of so-called adjuvant therapies, which are given after uh, surgery has been performed. And these are chemotherapy applications that people receive that really do make a big difference, and especially in areas like breast cancer uh, and in colon cancer. It's had a big impact on survival. So we're, we're doing better, and even people with metastatic disease. But the, you know, the big news now and the things you hear about and the things that are the focus of the cancer moonshot, if you will, are, are really um, these transformational new therapies. And I would say the two most important classes of new therapies that we have available to us right now are um, uh, immunotherapy and what you might call precision medicine. Precision medicine means understanding the arc molecular architecture of a cancer well enough that you can devise a therapy that will specifically disrupt the signaling elements that that cancer utilizes and that makes the cancer vulnerable to being killed. And there is a whole variety of, uh, of, uh, of new approaches uh, that involve the uh, obtaining of samples from patients and analyzing them in great detail and then using that information to customize and tailor their therapies. And you'll be hearing about that a little bit more uh, today from John and others. Um, immunotherapy is fantastically interesting. It's what I kind of do for a living, and so uh, I, I will admit to a bias. But it's, there's not an immunotherapy drug that is designed to specifically attach and destroy a cancer. Immunotherapy is a way of treating people's bodies so the people themselves can treat their own cancers. It's a strategy for mobilizing the body's immune system so that it will do the job for you. And in the past five years, a family of antibody drugs, these are proteins that are designed to attach to things that don't belong in your body that have been modified so they will attach to things we want them to attach to, so-called checkpoint inhibitors, they're called, are actually are designed so that they can, and this is fantastic stuff, they actually release the brakes of the immune system. When cancers are, are being attacked by the body's immune system, they develop defense mechanisms that allow them to survive uh, as, they, uh, as they are growing. And every successful cancer, if you will, has evaded or solved the problem of the body's own immune system that's been trying to attack it. And what's so interesting about these checkpoint antibodies, they're kind of like, a, you know, almost like a Greek mythological, you know, analogy. What happens is that the um, antibody attaches to a molecule on the surface of a cancer cell or a killer cell of the immune system, and it essentially interferes with the ability of the, of the, of the tumor cell to put the killer cell of the immune system to sleep. So it essentially, reverses, it essentially reverses a process wherein cancer cells ordinarily will defend themselves by inactivating the cells that are designed to kill it. It's a fantastic system that cancers have evolved. And in some patients, this has turned out to be a revolutionary treatment. There are patients with a disease, not a GI cancer, but, but, a, but an important cancer nonetheless, called melanoma, which is the non-routine skin cancers that people can get caused by sun exposure. When cancers, when melanoma has metastasized, it's a very, very serious illness, and it, and it can cause death, you know, very quickly. And in a very critically important um, trial conducted a few years ago by a collaboration of, of, of clinicians and uh, scientists that included folks from Georgetown, it was demonstrated that if you treat people with end-stage melanoma with six, seven months left to live based upon what we understand of the, about their cancers, with a combination of these checkpoint antibodies that basically allow the killer T cells of the immune system to reactivate and be there to kill the cancer cells, roughly 60% of the people who were treated 
had major anti-cancer responses. About a quarter of them had complete responses. And whether it was a major cancer response or a complete one, which is what you would think would be necessary, those people are not getting worse. Their cancers are going away, or, or quite nearly so, and they're not relapsing. So you take people who had a, virtually no chance of long-term survival, and now the, almost the majority of them are living four or five years out with no end in sight to their, to their good fortune. That's the transformational capacity of this class of antibodies. And if you think about it even uh, beyond that, there are roughly 25 different human cancers for which these kinds of antibodies have been shown to have important anti-cancer activities. Now, it doesn't work for every patient with every disease, and it doesn't always work forever, but it's a very, very powerful new tool we have. And one of our challenges is to figure out how to use it. And it's created all kinds of interesting challenges. For example, those of us who do clinical trials, we're accustomed to taking patients with advanced cancer and being able to run our clinical trials operation with a relatively small number of individuals who were involved in that clinical trial operation. Because unfortunately, our patients didn't do that well. They didn't live that long because these cancers were so bad. Now these people are living years. And so it, it take, creates an enormous stress on the whole apparatus of doing clinical research. It's the kind of problem we want to have, but we still have to figure out how to pay for it, right? And, and how you pay for it is one of the things that I think is a, a huge challenge for both immunotherapy and for precision medicine and for the whole field of cancer therapy. You'll remember that I, I told you that about 588,000 people are destined to die of cancer this year. And while it's better, we still have a long way to go. The, that translates to roughly 3,200 people in America who die of cancer every two days. Why is that number important? What does that number remind you of? Anybody? You got it. Every two days in the United States, it's a 9-11 in terms of cancer death, OK? Um, this is not to in any way minimize the horror of 9-11 or to suggest that we shouldn't be doing whatever is necessary to you know, protect American lives from terrorism, of course. But I would ask you, how much is enough when it comes to public funding of research to end this terrible killer that is killing people every two days? Under other circumstances, would we as a nation tolerate uh, the existence of a threat like this that was causing this, this rate of, uh, of death in, in the American population? Um, I, I, this, this has to be handled at pay grades considerably different than mine. However, I would suggest that um, when people say, well, aren't we giving enough money? After all, we spend $5 billion a year or thereabouts, a little more on the National Cancer Institute. I would say, well, you know, is it how, are, we using, are we using the amount of money we're spending on this as our measure, or are we using the impact that the money is having on reducing death rates? We've already shown that if you give $5 billion a year, or roughly that, that you can have a reduction in death rates of, of the types that I have demonstrated. Don't we want to do better? Don't we want to do it faster? Because you know, every time somebody dies of cancer, it's not just their life that's ending. It's the 10 lives of people who love them that are devastated as well. We have not done enough, and I think we can do more. And until the American people develop a sufficient appetite for investing in science and in discovery and in trying to do something about cancer, uh, we're never going to be able to make the kind of rapid progress we absolutely have to make in order to do something about this scourge. Having noted that, I think that uh, John and others have been real pioneers and I think very insightful in thinking about ways to develop creative partnerships between the academic community, the pharmaceutical industry, and government, and try to see how we can work together in the interest of our patients and in the interest of society at large. And I, and I do believe that as time moves on, we are going to have to start not breaking down firewalls in a manner that is harmful to the public good or the public interest. But I do think we have to find ways that we can all work together in a manner that allows us to accelerate cures. Because at the end of the day, that's what the moonshot is about. The moonshot has many um, ambitious goals. And I had the privilege of being a participant in one of the panels for the moonshot, not surprisingly the immunotherapy panel. Um, and I will say that uh, we all came away from this exercise energized by the prospects of 
trying to take these 10 areas that were called out and really turn them into something special, okay? The, um, the challenge we have is that as it exists today, it's an unfunded mandate. We don't really have a, a source of funding that we can identify that will be additional funding to, to, uh, to attack these, these important problems. And one of the worst things I think we can do is identify great ideas and new directions that we all want to go in and then find out that we really can't do them because the resources don't exist. So that's, a, I think, a, a major challenge. Uh, you know, for example, right now, and uh, John has heard me give this lecture, you know, when I see a patient in clinic or when John sees a patient in clinic, we more or less are flying blind still. We're using the same tools that we went, might have used had we been physicians in the 1940s. You know, we talk to the patient, we get a history, we do a physical examination, we take, get, take a look at laboratory studies, some x-ray studies, and yes, yeah, some of the studies are more um, elegant perhaps and more sophisticated, and that's all great, but we still have a very idiosyncratic and incomplete vision or invert of, of what's wrong with the patient. We don't know all the molecular abnormalities. Many groups, including ours, and you'll hear about this today, I'm sure, are taking uh, great steps in trying to understand the molecular architecture of cancers. But what the Cancer Moonshot's trying to do is to amalgamate all that information into, into data sets that we all can use to accelerate progress and that we can use individually with our patients in order to give them greater knowledge about what's going on and we can work together to make shared decisions about what kinds of spe special treatments we want to use. Well. That's a great idea, but again, you know, how are we going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? You know, and how are we going to actually do that when we know that whereas we can talk about using two expensive checkpoint antibodies that in aggregate cost $200,000 a year to give, okay, uh, in the United States, whereas somebody living in Central America, you know, you can't even get standard care necessarily, let alone get gain access to these kinds of expensive drugs. So there's a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities that we face. And you know what I think we have as, as a great op opportunity now is, is oh, uh, the finally enough great things that we can think about that we can begin doing a, a legitimate prioritization and, emph and emphasize those things that really make the most sense for us. I'm going to close with one last um, perspective uh, before I turn it over and let the people who are really going to do the work here uh, get started. And it's really about the cost of drugs. Um, we all know that the, that the cost of drugs is extraordinarily high. And those of us who've had the privilege of uh, being involved in clinical trials also understand how just very ex how expensive it is to make these kinds of drugs and how these drugs represent really the, the winners of a very large number of drugs that were developed, tested, and a lot of science that was done in the pharmaceutical industry. And trying to think about strategies to lower the cost of drugs is, is I think, one of the most important things we can do in, in our society at this time. One of the things that I've often wondered about, and I, I say this, you know, with, you know, again, you know, when you don't have a lot of specific information, I guess you can say anything. It doesn't much matter, right? So what, what, I, what, what, I'm, what I've been wondering about, and I, maybe it's something that can, we can have a discussion about later on, is whether it's possible for people with really bad diseases to be even more aggressive about saying, we don't have to have the same level of proof that something works if, if it's being used in a horrible disease like pancreatic cancer or, or colon cancer that's metastatic, where the life expectancy for the patient is so low. And maybe we can lower the bar for at least provisional approval so that you can actually have a, a, a a less expensive investment in that drug, and maybe that, that's, that savings could be passed on to the consumer down the road. And there are many iterations of that kind of stuff.
Our first panel is coming forward. I just want to ask one question specifically sure. about resources. As the director of a comprehensive cancer center, NCI does, mm -hmm. could you comment a little bit about the NCI budget and the role of comprehensive cancer centers in this uh, public-private partnership? Yeah. So the National Cancer Act was uh, was passed in 1971. Our cancer center was uh, established in 1974, just after the passage of that act. And um, I don't think it's an accident that the progress in cancer research over the last 40 years has been associated with the establishment of comprehensive cancer centers, NCI designated cancer centers. The vast majority of the high quality research done in our field is done in the, in the comprehensive cancer centers. They are the homes for the, the world's best cancer scientists and the world's best translational researchers. So we are a, um, and it's an absolutely essential resource. It's a very coveted designation. There's only 47 of us. And uh, uh, it's hard to get the designation. And I can tell you it's even harder to keep it. You know, this is a, it takes a lot of work. Um, and what's so interesting is we all slave away so that we can get a grant from the NCI that amounts to you know, a low of about a million dollars for some cancer centers to a high of maybe $10 million for other cancer centers. So the actual amount of money that we get from these grants is actually very minor by comparison to the amount of resource that we're expending to do the work we do and the kinds of uh, uh, resources it takes to run a clinical operation, et cetera. But Interestingly, even that small amount of money and the glamour of the designation has been enough to create an organizing principle around which the cancer centers are able to do their work. I will um, say that uh, a lot of us are being forced to do um, work through the NCI and what I would call an unfunded mandate, and we are grievously underfunded at this point in time, and we would certainly do do better and have a chance to make a greater impact if we had a greater amount of resource provided to provide the kind of coordinated activity in the way we do our research and the way that we deliver our clinical care to, in order to make an accelerated progress. But the cancer centers are, are clearly where the action is and as the only uh, NCI designated cancer center based in the District of Columbia, we're proud to be here and proud to be able to be a resource to our region, particularly in an era where we have the, uh, a, a great opportunity to turn our attention to another area of great Im importance to us, which is addressing disparities in care. Yes, there are global health disparities, but there are also micro microcosm disparities in our own district, and we are in a position to do something about that. Thank you very much. Thank you.